Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I don't know what's the problem here. I think it's a. Uh, must be Scott back there. The problem. No one wants to sit with us, do they? 1967. I hopped on a C-130 in Da Nang, coming home from Vietnam. And I didn't realize at that particular point in time that uh, they observed a holiday in, in Vietnam, probably in Southeast Asia, called Tet, T-E-T. -E and just a few months after I left, I can't remember what really how many months it was, but I was very lucky to get out of there when I did. Because when this holiday for those people came around, thousands and thousands of people were slaughtered. General Westmoreland was wrong when he said we had the world, the world war under control, and he didn't know what he was talking about. That's why he got dismissed, and someone else to put him there. So, when I got back to the states, I was stationed at the Marine Corps headquarters in Washington D.C., and one of my jobs was to do all the paperwork that the Marines were killed. All of a sudden, I started getting stacks, stacks of them. It takes probably about an hour to do one of SRBs and service record books to get the information that sent out to the parents and tell them that their son was dead. And so I had to rewrite how they were killed because if they're blown to bits, they're not going to tell their parents that. So I kept getting all these. said, what in the world is going on here? And that's what it was. It was the Tet Offensive. And you can see that on the History Channel from time to time when they show war in Vietnam. And I bet you today, when Tet rolls around, whatever month that is, they celebrate greatly in Vietnam for their victory over the great and powerful United States of America. And that little place, I'm telling you, it's a nice place to visit, but you, won't, you would not want to live there. It's extremely hot, extremely humid, and in the monsoon seasons, it's extremely cold, down to 50 degrees. That's cold when you're up to 100 and something. And so, I'm sure they celebrate that day with great joy of the victory over us. And they did beat us. They didn't win the war. They didn't win the battles, but they won the war. So all nations have holidays they celebrate. All nations do that. So I went on the Internet I said, this is kind of interesting. Let's just see what people celebrate. If I were to tell you what people celebrate, we'd be here for a month. I could not believe it. At all the nations, all the little countries, I clicked on that, and it showed one day after another what people celebrated. Then I clicked on what it was they celebrated, and it went into great detail what that was all about. So I didn't have enough ink, I didn't have enough paper, I didn't have enough time to run it all off. But I'll give you a little hint what people do. Hong Kong. I saw this and it says, Holy Saturday. I said, well, now that has to do with the Sabbath. No, 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 no. It commemorates the first day of Christ when he laid in a tomb after Good Friday until Sunday morning. That's what it's about. It's called Easter Eve, Easter evening, or Black Sabbath. I wonder if that's where that rock group got their name, or title their name from Black Sabbath. In Canada, it just was roll after roll after roll that people in Canada observe. One of them was called St. David's Day. I said, I gotta look at that thing. St. David, he was a patron saint of Wales. He was, they commemorate that day, I think, because he brought a little uh, knowledge and culture to that system. And so they celebrate that day. They celebrate Whit Monday. I don't know if you ever heard of that or not. Whit Monday. It's a substitute for Pentecost. You know, say they wear white, was it white ash, windy, or something like that. They also have Trinity Sunday in, in Turkey, uh, in uh, Canada. In Turkey, it's called Ramadan Feast East Eve. Ramadan feast, Ramadan one, Ramadan two, Ramadan three, Ramadan four, all on different days. 
and uh, the rest of the things they, they observed, I couldn't pronounce them. Because they're in Arabic. I couldn't pronounce it. I don't know what the world was. In Russia, you women's going to like this. You might want to move to Russia. Defenders of the Fatherland. And they also have International Women's Day. So you might want to go over there and see what it's all about. In India, can you believe this? They celebrate Chinese New Year and Halloween in China. So all nations have their days that they worship. And so do we. So do we. In the United States of America, I didn't even bother to go with that one because I knew all that stuff. We do celebrate Independence Day on the 4th of July. In Mexico, it's the 5th of May. And in France, it's the 14th, called the Festival of France. So all nations and states and kingdoms of this world have their special days on which they remember the important events of their history. Let's turn over to John's 18th chapter. I believe I have the wrong glasses. Because this is, again, look fuzzy to me. Can I borrow your glasses, Mr. Grant? <laughs> if I get down real low like that, I can see it. This is the problem when you get old. You can't see. John, the 18th chapter, again, verse 33. Then Pilate entered to the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Are thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Sayest thou this thing there yourself, or did some other people tell you of me? And sarcastically, Pilate said, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you unto me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. Now, in a parable that Jesus telling his disciples and told, telling us, he said, there was a certain nobleman that went into a far country to receive for instance, a kingdom and to return. Well, he hasn't returned yet, has he? He hasn't come back yet. And even though he has not come back yet, you and me, the house of God, are to keep the days that he has commanded us to keep. Because the kingdom is not here yet, we are still to do it. We are to do these days, what we're doing now, as a reminder of important events that happened in the past and events that are going to happen in the near, near future. These days are so important that God commanded his people to observe them forever. Now, a lot of people think these are old Jewish days that they were done away with upon the death of Jesus Christ. That simply is not true. All they got to do is read the last few chapters in the book of Ezekiel, and you'll see these days are mentioned there again. You can look at the time slip. It's talking about the future. This day is mentioned. Unleavened bread is mentioned. The is mentioned. Sabbath is mentioned. All of it's mentioned there in the last chapters of the book of Ezekiel. So we're to keep these days. Now, the word ambassador is mentioned 12 times in both the New and the Old Testament. In 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse 20, he says, you are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Now, the word ambassador means that you're someone who represents Christ and his kingdom, which is not here yet. It's just like if you were an ambassador of the United States, you went to another nation, you still obey our own laws that we have. And so since we're a part of the house of God, we're a part of this foreign government that's coming to this earth, then we're to observe the things that he tells us to observe. And there's a reason why we observe these things. Events that happened in the past and things that are going to take place in the very near future. And he wants us to keep, these in, keep us in mind of what's taking place here. I've read sometimes on the Internet that it says, Jesus is not God. I used to reply to nonsense like that. But think of it this way. If Jesus is not God, you would have no New Testament. You would know nothing about the apostles. There'd be no New Testament church. In fact, let's go a little further than that. If Jesus is not God, there would be no Old Testament. 
There'll be no old covenant. There'll be no prophets. There'll be no universe. There'll be no earth. And you wouldn't even be here. Think about that. If Jesus is just a myth, you would not even be here if that's true. Jesus observed these days, and they're mentioned in the, in the book of Revelation. If you, if you ever check it out. The Day of Atonement is mentioned there. The Feast of Trumpets is mentioned there. The Last Great Day is mentioned there. It's all there. And the book of Revelation is a futuristic book. So Jesus observed these same days. His followers continued to keep them after his death. Today, modern Christianity has never heard of them, for the most part. Simply refuse. They do, they refuse, refuse to keep them, calling the, those days just Jewish days to the Jewish people. Now, the Jews do from... How can I put this? If you go on the Internet and when Passover comes around, just type in Passover and see what it says the Jewish people think about it. It's a day of holiday for them. It's a day of selling gift baskets. It's a day, a day of joy to those people. Same thing with the Day of Atonement. I just found out when I got on the internet uh, for the Day of Atonement, they have atonement recipes. Those are the Jewish people. Now, they do one thing really well. They observe the Feast of Tabernacles, and they have a ball. They're dancing. I don't know if they have any speakers or not, but they, they sing, they dance. This is a joyful time for those people, and it should be. But they still don't know what it's all about. Just like you saw on the, uh, the film of the day, that astronaut. He said, I know there's a purpose. He just doesn't know. He doesn't know. So, if you don't keep these, let's just call them holidays for the sake of it. The holidays for the new world to come. The holidays for the new world to come. But not keeping God's commanded days, that leaves what? It leaves a void. And that void has to be filled. So what happens? Modern Christianity does this. They decide they like keeping pagan holidays. They love Christmas. So did I when I was a young kid. Oh, I wanted my brother and sister to come home so I could lay on the floor and sleep as a little boy and look at that fireplace and waiting for Santa Claus to come down it. I never did think about how in the world is he going to get down that chimney and not get burnt. There's a fire in that thing. But I love the smells. I love the colors and the songs when I was a small child about Christmas. That's just pass it on, but it stopped. At the age 30, it stopped for me. And uh, I don't keep that anymore. So we, it sounds religious, doesn't it? Christmas, the Mass of Christ, the day that Jesus Christ was born, so they say. And next comes Easter. We got to fill the void. Easter sounds religious. It sounds right. Nowhere are we commanded to keep Esther Day, Easter. The resurrection, they call it. All Souls Day, New Year's Day. We do this. The modern house of Israel does this. Now, I don't know how, much, how many Israelites are left in this nation anymore. We're getting overrun by Gentiles, which is prophesied to happen anyhow, that the population of Israel will grow smaller. And that's exactly what is taking place. They do this. I'm talking about modern Christianity does this. Despite God's warning in Jeremiah 10, do not learn the way of the heathen. It goes in one ear and out the other, if they even read it at all. Don't learn that way. And he goes on to tell you what some of the things they do. And we still do it, don't we? We still do it. We ignore it. We don't believe the Bible when it comes right down to it. We simply do not believe what God says. And we're going to learn the hard way. So modern Christianity is deeply rooted in paganism, which God never commanded us to keep. They mean absolutely nothing compared to what we are observing. These days we're observing God gave them to us for a purpose. They're here for us. We're training, folks. We're in training. And if you can't keep these days, you think you're going to keep them in the future? I don't think so. 
if you and I are loyal and faithful citizens, if we are ambassadors of this soon coming kingdom, we should not be following the ways of this present evil world, as Paul stated, the world we live in, this present evil world. This is what Paul says to the church at Ephesus. It's in Ephesians 2nd chapter and verse 19. Look at it. Let it sink in your mind what Paul is saying to us. Ephesians 2 and verse 19. So now, th there, now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but cit fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God. That means you represent the kingdom of God. You are an ambassador. And being an ambassador, we should act like it. We're an ambassador of a foreign government. One of the greatest governments, well, it is the greatest government to ever, to ever come to this earth. I was trying to figure out what I was going to talk about today. I have another sermon over here, which I'm going to give to Mr. Taylor. Let him do it. He didn't have enough. But it's, it's entitled, The End of Human Governments. And I was going over in my mind, which one should I do? So I said, I'll do this one. But that one I've got, I'll do it sometime in Morristown and be videoed and show you exactly the prophecies that are coming about that deals with the end of human governments and human paganism, all this nonsense we go through, all the stupidity we allow our minds to be corrupted by Satan the devil, and he's very clever at it. I know modern Christianity uh, likes to make fun and ridicule Satan the devil. That's not right at all. I know he's an evil being. The only thing God says is that the Lord rebuke you. He's an anointed cherub. He's the God of this world. He's the king of this world. And though he's not a very nice being, that's what he is. Now God says, the Lord rebuke you. But he's very clever in what he does. Did you know, before you were called, that you were under the influence of him? I didn't. I thought this is just natural for me to, to lie, cheat, kill, and all the stuff I did. All the laws, I lived outside of the bounds of God's laws, so did you. Because you probably didn't know anything about him. I didn't. Didn't know one thing about Jesus Christ, the Bible, even though my father's a Baptist minister. I'm glad none of that junk stuck in my head. He was gracious enough to me. And when I was probably around 12 or 13, he more or less said, David, do what you want. You can go to church on Sunday or not. So I didn't. And I'm glad I didn't. Because none of that garbage is in my mind. None of it. Now that the kingdom is, as of yet hasn't been established on this earth, until it is, the citizens that you and I are, are like foreigners or resident aliens living in this world, but you're not a part of it. You're not a part of it. Every year, the nations of this world observe their special days. Don't we? Well, what have we got coming up to see? We've got the devilish day coming up in what, about a week or so. That stupid day, Halloween, and Thanksgiving is all right because it's, it's not the same it was when I was growing up because let's hurry at me because we've got to go watch a football game. And I doubt very seriously if anyone offers thanks to God for living in this country while it's still free. And we know that's coming to an end on Thanksgiving. And then we got the great one coming up, Christmas, in which people get to go in debt for hundreds and hundreds of dollars, and time they get it paid off, Christmas is back again, and you get to start all over again and being in debt. So every nation has their days. So if you claim to be a citizen or an ambassador of the kingdom of God, should you not also observe the days that God commanded us to do? And those of you who will be watching this later, who maybe are not part of this church, you've got a lot of thinking to do of what you're doing. So, he set forth, that is Jesus Christ, the God of the Old Testament, 
special days. Let's just say they're holidays for the sake of it. And they're found in the book of Exodus. I'm mean, sorry, Leviticus chapter 23. So what I want to do, I want to show you the events that are going to happen through these days. How God is going to bring, around, bring about redemptive salvation to all of mankind. All of us, even the little pygmies who run around in Africa shooting darts at monkeys to eat. To the other people in Africa and, and uh, South America who run around with hardly any clothes at all, at all on, who can't speak English, who wants to be away from civilization, they are going to learn. Put your clothes on. And learn to eat right. And guess who's going to teach them? They are in this order. The Passover. The Days of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, our Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Seven Days of the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Last Great Day of the Feast, which is a separate festival known as the Last Great Day. These days are the national days of the Kingdom of God, just like we have national days in the United States of America. These are God's days his, in His Kingdom, and they are commemorated or anticipated the most important events that will ever affect the human race. When you're not, when you don't tell people this, they don't know that they don't know. They don't know what they're doing is wrong because their parents taught them. And they had kids and they taught their parents. And on and on it goes. That's how these days gets, gets carried out from one generation to another. They never look and see, well, They'll say, I know it's pagan, but I'm not doing it that way. I'm not observing it as a pagan day. I'm doing it to honor Christ, to honor Jesus. But that's not what he says in the book of Deuteronomy. When you see how these other people observe their days, don't do those days and think you're honoring me, because you're not. Don't do it. I know it's hard. This is very hard. When you go through a Walmart and they're playing Christmas music, next thing you know you're singing Jingle Bells because it's, it's ground in your mind. And you just keep right on going. I like going there because I'm, I'm a, I love colors. Colors fascinate me. See that tie, all those colors in that tie? They fascinate me. And I've seen some of the, not seen them, but I, I know what the colors are in the New Jerusalem. And it's just absolutely gorgeous. God loves colors too. I think his favorite color is this color. He has a rainbow behind his throne. It's green. But like I said, these days are the national days of the kingdom of God. And they commemorate things that are going to take place. So let's see why. These holy days are observed at two seasons of the year corresponding to the spring and fall harvest seasons in the northern hemisphere is what we're doing right now. It's beautiful out there, is it not? We got here just in time to see all the colors change. Beautiful colors. Told you God loves colors. So that makes sense. Since they symbolize seven essential steps in the great national purpose of the kingdom of God, that being the harvest of the human race, The people are really suffering, aren't they? Around this world is suffering. Africa is just it's just a disease ridden uh, continent. And I'm really, I'm going I've got an article I'm going to look at and look into good hope is coming to Africa. There is hope for Africa. There is hope for the Muslim world. There is hope for modern Christianity. There is hope for the Catholic religion. There is hope for all of us, the world. His name is Jesus Christ. And these days predict that hope, what it's all about, what's coming to this world. It's so sad that people have to suffer this way because they don't know. Satan has done a masterful job of blinding those, their eyes. They can't see. They just can't see. And it's going to be interesting to see this, because I believe when the Day of Atonement, the second part of the Day of Atonement is fulfilled, this spiritual uh, cataract of this earth is going to be lifted. 
And people are going to say, oh, now I see. How come I didn't see this before? Because you're blinded. You're blinded by the great power that exists on this earth, and Satan and the devil and his de demonic kingdom. That's what uh, Michael Savage calls Obama, demonic. Sometimes I have to agree with it. The United States struggled to establish itself as a nation after its Declaration of Independence. It really struggled. Those men put their lives on the line so we could be what we have today. It's just unfortunate that uh, we have people who no longer want to observe uh, that uh, Declaration or the Constitution. Winston Churchill rallied the people, British people, to stand fast against Hitler after the rest of Europe had collapsed into early months of World War II. They just gave up and quit. They just gave up and quit. Today, millions of people think Jesus is trying to save the world now. They really do. It's not their fault. They just don't know the Jesus Christ that you and I know. They don't know the real Jesus, the Garner Ted used to put it. The real Jesus. They think they're helping him do their job, his job. He didn't need help. So they worked tirelessly to preach in Jesus' name, persuading others to accept him, to give him their hearts to be born again. If I am born again now that I accept Christ, unborn me, because I don't like this body that I have at this age. If I'm born again, I want a new body, don't you? Do you want the same body? You got to wear these stupid things to see. So far, I can hear really well. And I can walk fairly well without falling over. I remember years ago, I was listening to Mr. Trent down in Panama City Beach at the feast down. He was talking about he was, a, he was an athlete like I was. We use was now. And he said, I, don't, I used to be able to dunk the ball, and now I can't even jump off the stage. <laughs> Believe it or not, folks, I'm six foot three, and I can almost touch the top of the backboard, and the backboard is about 12 feet high. I can't even touch the net now. I had that type of jumping ability. Times the coach said, I'm afraid you're going to get hurt. And I said, what are you talking about? Hitting my head on the rim. I even asked my dad, I said, Dad, is my head above the rim? He said, yeah, it is. I never even thought about it. But I can't do any of that stuff no more. That's gone. All that athletic ability is gone. So I'm waiting to really be born again. This time when I leap, I may run into the moon. So people think they're trying to help Jesus Christ save the world. There's only one great problem with that. Jesus isn't trying to save the world. If he is, he's failing. And Satan is winning. That's what they say. Let's win souls for the Lord. That means there's a contest going on, according to them. But there is no contest. And these holy days, holidays, holy days, we observe, tells us what Jesus Christ is doing. I typed a word down. It doesn't make sense at all. They think Jesus is, a, is in lock with a race against time. You've got to do it now. You know, if you don't do it now, Christ could come any time, and then you're going to burn in hell forever and ever. That's the mindset. What Satan has put in these people to think that God is like that, that he'll burn you up and burn you up and never burn up. This simply isn't true at all. God is not like that at all. That he's trying to pluck souls out of the hand of Satan's clutches before it's too late. As I said, if that's true, and certainly Satan is winning this battle. But nothing could be more wrong than that. Nothing. The fact is, God, through Jesus Christ, is saving the human race according to a logical, careful, thought-out plan. And it is. It's very logical. It's something that a human mind could not come up with. Only God could have come up with this plan to bring the redemptive salvation to man. And salvation is a learning process. That's why we're to grow. 
That means you don't know something. You have to go learn it. So it is a process, and God knows it's a process. And so his plan, although you look at the world, and they say, well, where is God? But that plan, folks, is right on schedule. He doesn't miss a beat. It's right on schedule. God has not even begun to deal with humanity as of yet, but he's going to. That's where this massive invasion from outer space is coming. It's coming to this earth. To the intervention of Jesus Christ and the affairs of mankind to finally, finally, after 6,000 years of more than 13,500 wars since Cain killed Abel, this earth is going to have its sabbatical rest. And peace and harmony and prosperity will finally break out. Now, I know that Jesus Christ has a three and a half ministry left to do, so it may take that long for you and I to use a rod of iron to straighten people's minds out in a loving, kind way. But it will be used for a little while. God even explains these steps in his plan to save mankind through the annual festivals. So when we keep these days, we're annoying. We know what God is doing. What God's will is. Just keep the days. And understand why you're here. Why you're here. And you can understand the mind of God. The Passover is the first great event. Uh, the citizens of the kingdom of God will commemorate each year. Now, is that what we do? It is observed as an anniversary of the day when Jesus was betrayed and put to death. Not his resurrection, as Easter says, as the old Pope hollers up in the window, Happy Easter! In his dunce cap. I wonder how he goes to the bathroom with all that stuff he wears. History from time to time has been changed because of heroic acts of a courageous leader. But the destiny of everyone who has ever lived was altered by what? By the death of Jesus Christ. Your life has been altered. You were going the wrong way, right? You were living outside the bounds of God's law, right? You're right. You didn't know that. You thought you, what you were doing was correct. That's what the carnal mind thinks. It reasons that way. I don't see anything wrong with this. Well, look through it through the eyes of God. Look through it through the man who died to change your life, to alter your destination. That's what he did. And that's, we need to think that way. His death altered your destiny. Your destiny was the lake of fire. The wages of sin is death, the second death, he says. And everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This changed everything. The Passover changed everything. It altered everything. Now you have a chance to live. All of us remember the famous golden verse, do unto others as you haven't done to you. It's a well-known cliche. But this is what God says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that who so whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And God means exactly what he says in that verse. God does love the human race, no matter how bad we are. He doesn't love the sin because he knows sin hurts us. And it hurts him to see us suffering because we break his laws. And he doesn't like that. God does love the human race, and he has plans for the human race. Like the astronaut didn't know what it was. He wants us, all of us, to live and to share in his glory forever and forever and forever. Your mind can't conceive of that. Because you live between two points. You have the beginning, you have the end. You can't think of anything larger than that. You know there's a point in time we didn't exist. You know there's a point in time we are going to die. But God wants to give you everlasting life. Each and every one is. That's how much he loves you. How much he wants to be, you to be a part of his family. There's a great big universe out there, folks, and it's waiting on us. That's what it says. Huh? The universe is moaning and crying out, waiting for us. So what are we supposed to be doing? Your heart 
should be in the process of being changed to a spiritual heart. Those ambassadors, you and me, whose hearts have been changed are the ones that are going to be chosen. Like it says, many are called, but only a few are chosen. That's the difference. People's hearts have changed. And they're going to be called of God. They're called the elect or the chosen one. In Matthew 24 chapter. Now, Jesus Christ never sinned. He never earned the wages of sin, which the Bible says is death. So each year, his fellow ambassadors observe the Passover quietly, gracefully, and thoughtfully. They take the symbols of his sacrifice and commit their lives and loyalty to him anew. After Christ's death, he was resurrected and took again his place beside his Father in heaven. But God knew that Jesus was to be the firstborn of many brethren. You can read that in uh, Romans 8 and verse 29. He's the firstborn of many brethren. The firstborn. That ought to give you some clue in your mind, especially in the Protestant world. If there's a firstborn, there has to be a second. Does it? Only makes sense to me. Of course, who am I? <laughs> Across the centuries, God has called very few others out of this world to prepare to rule with Christ in his kingdom. Are you prepared to do that? Let's just use a phrase that modern Christianity uses. If Jesus Christ would come tonight, are you prepared to be born again? Are you prepared to take a job of ruling over cities? Are you prepared to do a job of a priest? Now, Micah, Malachi says the, the law shall never leave the priest's mouth. Are you prepared to do that? Do you know the laws of God? Do you know the statutes and the judges? Mr. Taylor brought out in trumpets. Do you know them? If you don't know them, how are you going to teach them? Are you prepared to be born again? Are you prepared to rule with Jesus Christ? Folks, that's something to think about. Don't let that go in one ear and out the other. Are you preparing to meet your creator? That's what it says. I think it's in the book of Amos. Prepare to meet thy God. The first of these called out must what? You must overcome your own human nature. You must do that. Human nature with its greed, with its vanity and its selflessness. For human nature is inspired by the God of this world. It is the cause of the misery and the suffering among the kingdoms of this world. That's the reason they want to fight. The wars come from lust. You lust after another person, another people's land. That's what the Chinese did to the Japanese. That's what the Japanese did to the Chinese in the 30s. They lacked the land. They didn't have that much land over there. So they said, oh, let's just go over and take it. That's what they did. They slaughtered thousands thousands of Chinese. That's why the Chinese can't hate the Japanese today, or what they did. They were worse. The Japanese were worse to the Chinese than, than Hitler was to the Jews. In fact, they learned from the Japanese how to torture the Jews. And we allow that guy to get away with Hiro Hito. Is that his name? He used to be the premier of Japan who thought he was a god. They let him get away scot-free. He knew all this stuff was taking place. He approved of it. So those who are qualifying to rule with Christ must learn put that way of sin out of our lives. That's the meaning of the days of unleavened bread. To deleaven your lives. And it's not easy to do that. Your family won't allow you to will fight against you. Your neighbors will fight against you. Your people you work for will fight against you. They don't know what they're doing, but that's what they're doing. They're making it hard for you. They don't know that they're under the sway of the God of this world. Obeying God's instruction for the days of unleavened bread is a practical lesson in overcoming sin. Why do you need to overcome sin for? Because this penalty is death. That's why. Eternal death. But we can't do this by ourselves. It's, well, it's impossible to overcome sin by yourself. You need help. And Jesus Christ knew that. He said, without me, you could do nothing. He said, I don't do these things. It's my Father who dwells in me, does the works that I do. The same thing applies to you and I. You can't do this by yourself. That's why the next holy day comes into effect. The day of Pentecost, the first roots. The day that Jesus Christ, once he ascended back to his Father in heaven, sent the Comforter. Because he knew that overcoming sin 
but it's absolutely impossible through a carnal mind. Christ knew that his ambassadors, however willing we are, cannot even begin to do the work of God, whether it was preaching or overcoming human nature or our own efforts. It can't be done. He knew that, so he sent us help. He sent us help. And that brings us to the next festival. Like I said, it's Pentecost, the day that sometimes called the Feast of First Fruits. It symbolized the harvest of the first group of people to be rescued from death. Folks, that's you. That is a future event that's going to take place. Hopefully not too long from now. And the way things are going, he's going to rescue you from death. He's coming. Her Savior is coming. That's what you read about in Acts, the second chapter. Look at the, look at the difference in Peter's mindset. He had a very... He had a problem with anger. But look at him now. Look how courageous they became once they had the power of the Holy Spirit in their mind. How they faced the Pharisees and said, we ought to obey God, not you. Well, that probably got their goats saying something like that. But you can see what the Holy Spirit does. He gives you strength. He gives you a powerful mind. But it grows. It has to grow. Continually growing on a daily basis. So, because of Pentecost, those few ambassadors that God has called to be first fruits will be ready upon the return of Jesus Christ. That's what it says in the book of Revelation. The bride, the bride, that's you, has made herself ready. Are you doing that? Are you ready to be married? It's a spiritual marriage, folks, not a physical thing. Are you ready to marry your creator? Are you ready to marry your soon coming king and savior. Are you really? Can God look at you and say, yeah, there's something I want to keep forever. I see something in that person's mind that I want to preserve forever and forever in my family. Can he see that in you? Sometimes I have to look in a mirror and say, what are you looking at? You want me? Me? Well, here I am. So evidently he must, or I wouldn't be here. And I know what I'm like. I just don't tell people. I really don't tell people about me. Because God knows, that's all that counts. He knows about me. He knows my foolishness and stuff that I do. He knows that. He knows my evil thoughts from time to time. I get when I look at the elections, when I look at Hillary Clinton, Clinton. Look at all the stupidity and foolishness and politics brings on this earth. No wonder he's coming back to do away with these stupid, idiotic governments of this earth. He only tolerates this nonsense until his plan is put into action. And he's going to put a stop to it. In Daniel, the second chapter, verse 44, the stone is cut out. To destroy all human governments. And set up the kingdom of God with all the ambassadors there with him. That he has called to those who have overcome. Without God's Holy Spirit, Paul writes this in Romans the 8th chapter, verse 6 through 8. For to be carnally minded, that's the mind we were born with, is death, the second death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace forever. Because the carnal mind is hostile against God, it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So what are you? Are you an ambassador? Are you in the flesh or in the spirit? Don't make your mind. Where is your mind? That's the most precious thing you have, folks, is your mind. So where is it? What is the most important thing on your thoughts on a daily basis? What comes first in your mind? The kingdom of God or what? What is it? With the added power of God working in us, we can build godly character. And that's what it means when it says uh, in Genesis 1, verse 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness. That's really what it means. When you look at the deep Hebrew word of that, it means to be able to develop godly character with the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what man's put on this earth in the first place for, to do just that. And it will work out as God's going to see that it does. 
Now we are uniquely prepared to help Christ as it begins the next exciting stage of the kingdom's long-range plan. This is what you're training for. I want you to think, folks. Think. Think of all the difficulties you're going to confront with human beings that live in the millennium. Not only that, who come up in the second resurrection with all their faults, with all their religious, religious different beliefs, all of it, all their paganism in their minds. You're going to deal with Hitler. You're going to deal with uh, 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 Alexander the Great, Nebuchadnezzar. Think about these things and deal with these people. And you've got to have a mind of God to do that. I know we probably would like to slap them upside the face and say, well, like your fire you go. That's not what God did to us, was it? One time they asked this great big German guy. He was the head of the Luftwaffe. I can't think of his name right now. He said, why didn't you go over that little runt, talking about Hitler, and pick him up and knock him around a little bit? He said, buddy, you never heard him speak before. He was scared. To, this giant man was scared of that little runt. If he'd done that and knocked him around a few, well, maybe we wouldn't have had World War II. But they were so afraid of him. So, are you ready for what the next phase is coming? This future event that is coming. This massive event that is coming on this earth. That is the Feast of Trumpets. God's holy days move from commemorating things that already happened to the realm of events that are going to happen. War is on the horizon. World War III is on the horizon. Nuclear weapons and biological and chemical weapons will be used. He says, all your cities shall be laid waste. Talking about Israel. What would cause that? War is looming. There's a guy on television. I think his name is Wombach or something like that. It's called the Gospel Truth. And one day he was talking about what I'm going to talk about here. It's in Colossians, the second chapter, verse 13 when Paul refers to the holy days as a shadow of things to come. And he says, you know, a shadow means it's gone, it's done away with. When you go outside and the sun is shining, and you cast a shadow, what's casting the shadow? You. Because you're real. Only real things can cast shadows. I can't have, I don't know if I got one up here or not, these lights. But that's what the holy days do. They cast a shadow of things to come, not to do away with them. These people were uh, aesthetic Gentile people. That means they believed in such as philosophy, vain philosophies, and touch not this and see not that, all this stuff you read about there in Colossians. And they were having problems with their neighbors and their families and friends. Why are you observing these holy days? You don't need to do that no more. Go back to what you were told to do. And Paul was telling them, don't let them do this to you. Because they were Gentiles. They never observed these holy days before they were called. And Paul was getting, trying to encourage them. These are a shadow of things to come. Don't give up on them. Don't quit. A, a shadow is cast by something that is real. God has allowed this earth to be ruled by Satan and the forces of evil ever since the Garden of Eden. It says in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, you don't have to turn it because you know it by heart. It says, whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And he says this about Satan in Ephesians 2 and verse 2, that he is a spirit. It's talking about Satan, who works in the sons of disobedience. That means it's people who live outside the bounds of God's law. He deals with them. He's got them. He's got them. Or at least he thinks he's got them. During Christ's earthly ministry, Christ qualified to replace Satan as ruler of this earth. But God's plan did not call for him to take power at that particular time, did he? No, he's, he's, he won't leave a throne empty. He will not do that. Let's see how much time i got before I go on. i got about 20 more pages of notes. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Satan has been allotted to continue to rule this earth for 6,000 years. Or, I put 2,000 years, but that's not correct. It's 6,000. The liberation from Satan, evil rule, is on the way. 
That's why Jesus Christ must come back. He must come back to fulfill the last part of the Day of Atonement. <clears throat> he is the high priest coming back as the physical high priest did in the Old Testament. Put his hands on the goats and the goat will let loose. But Jesus Christ is coming back to liberate the earth from Satan, the devil, to fulfill, fulfill the last part of the Day of Atonement. That's what this earth is looking forward to, or at least we are, to 1,000 years without him in the demonic world. You can't imagine what that's going to be like to live that way and not have that influence on your minds, especially not your minds, but the minds of human beings who are being left alive on this earth after World War III is over. The time, he, <clears throat> excuse me, the time, this time he's not, he's, not, he's not coming back as a baby in a manger, but as a triumphant king. He will not be coming back in a secret rapture, as some claim to be. There's never going to be an event like this. He is going to roll back the heavens like a scroll, and we're all going to see this. And he's coming on that white horse and the host of angels with him. And somewhere between this earth and up and who knows how far up, you're going to meet him. And he's coming back with him. As he set his feet on the Mount of Olives, so will you. And from there, we go to work. We go to work. But that, Satan has to be done away with. And that's what the Day of Atonement is. You can't have two kingdoms living side by side, one evil and one good. It'd be a constant fight. And so one's got to go, and he's got to go. And he's going to go. And it's like I say, he's not coming back in a secret rapture. But he's coming back as a conquering king. You know, every eye is going to see this. In First Thessalonians 4, verse 16, you've got to hurry along here. Christ will return with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. We're going to hear that loud sound. It's going to pierce the ears. That's why he tells us to lift up the voice like a trumpet, because a trumpet is a loud, piercing sound. It penetrates the eardrums. No other instrument does that. And this sound, when it comes, it's going to penetrate the eardrums of the humans that are left alive. It will be an invasion from outer space, the likes of which this world has never seen. He says, in Revelation 1, verse 7, says, Every eye shall see this event. It will be the greatest turning point in history. Thank God for that. Before the kingdoms of this world are liberated by the kingdom of God, the human race will have to come within the hairbreadth of destroying itself. Destroying itself. The ultimate cliffhanger is going to have a happy ending. He's going to put a stop to it because of you, because of the ambassadors of the house of God. He's going to put a stop to it and cut it short. So we in God's church celebrate this tremendous event in advance before it happens. Another reason to celebrate this is the resurrection. If he doesn't come back, you don't get resurrected. You don't get that body you want. So he's going to do that to resurrect you, to give you mortal life, to give you a glorious body, to give you a position in his kingdom, whatever that's going to be, king, priest, or governor of cities, mayors, whatever it is, he is going to do that. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, David, and the apostles have been dead for centuries. Others, including most of us, call today, will be alive and waiting for this moment to take place. In a twinkling of an eye, Paul writes, our human bodies, composed of physical matter, will be transformed into immortal spiritual bodies ready to begin your life, your eternal life. And this will happen in the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets. Something else to celebrate in advance before it happens. So by now, we in God's church should see why these feasts are so important to the citizens of the kingdom of God because it deals directly with you and I. And that's why it's so important. When a dictator is overthrown, you can see people dancing in the streets, can't you? What happened when Hussein was overthrown? Do you see the people dancing in and tearing that statue of him down? Rejoicing? The hateful end of a regime like that? Today, most people do not understand that Satan is the real ruler of this world. So when Christ returns, he must deal with his arch enemy, and he's going to do that. I, I, let me see here. What have I got? I probably have to stop. I don't have much. Oh, Okay.
So sometime in the distant past, before man was created, Lucifer, who chose to become the adversary rather than the assistance of God, became what he is, Satan the devil. Since that time, Satan has acted in a ruthless, relentless opposition to everything God stands for. Satan is consumed by hatred for you, especially you, the ambassadors of God, because we are designed, destined to reinherit all things he once tried to take by force. It didn't work. So when Satan comes, and when Christ comes, Satan has to go. That's the Day of Atonement. You read about that in Revelation 20, verse 1 through 3. Before that occurs, the citizens of the kingdom celebrate that day of liberation in advance. We did that just a few days ago, didn't we? We celebrate in advance, looking forward on the Day of Atonement to the time when God, when the world will be at one with their creator. Finally. With Satan gone, the kingdom of God now began, now can begin to rule. Maybe you don't think like that. He has to go before the kingdom can rule. He'd just be a pain if he didn't. So this is where we are now. The Feast of Tabernacles. To rule in this wonderful new world that's come to this earth. And everything's going to be different. And that's why we're here to celebrate in advance the Feast of Tabernacles, the high spot of God's holy days. The Feast of Tabernacles is an opportunity to travel to, uh, for recreation, for fun and instruction. But it also pictures the millennial rule of Christ on this earth. When nations will live at peace and harmony, working for each other's good. Doesn't happen now. Instead of living the way of rivalry, competition, and selfishness as we have today. One more job or great task for the kingdom of God before the job of rescuing humanity is over. The vast majority of people who have lived with ever hearing the name of Jesus Christ, let alone his message, is coming. It is coming. And Mr. Trent will go through that in the last day. Most Christianity has no answer for those people who have died in the Old Testament. How in the world is God going to save them? So he will do that on the last great day. And so I'm going to jump ahead here just right quickly. One day all people will understand how the how they commemorate or anticipate the events that led to the human race out of bondage of sin and death and launch them toward the true destiny of eternal life. And that is exactly what we're doing here in advance, observing these high days that God has given us in advance so we can celebrate those things when in the future we can be a part of them. <laughs>